Well, it's been a while since I was last behind a camera. Yes, I'm back. I've enjoyed my time away from YouTube over the last few months, and I think it's been more than two months since my last video. But I'm ready to start talking again because there's one particular subject that I know a lot of you have wanted me to comment on. Now, 2020 hasn't really been the best year for news. A lot of it's been focused on COVID or Black Lives Matter or the orange boy. But when it comes to trans stuff, we've mostly seen just attempts at cancelling celebrities. Someone has made a comment that goes against the trans orthodoxy, and the mob tries to make them persona non grata. The biggest example, of course, is JK Rowling, who lovingly sends me some flowers. But the topic I want to talk about today is one of everyone's favourite subjects, trans kids. Yes, if you're a political movement, there is no better weapon to add to your arsenal than an innocent child. Whether it's environmentalism or gun rights, everyone on every side of the political spectrum loves putting a child in front of a camera and guilting everyone into following their views. And naturally, the trans community is no exception to this. Trans kids have been a massive part of this whole debate, and you wouldn't have organisations like Mermaids existing without it. So what is it that I'm going to talk about in this video that I have already discussed in the past. Some of my older viewers might remember that I did cover trans kids more than a year ago, but this all concerns a particular court case brought up by Kira Bell. Now, a lot of my American viewers might not know who she is, but Kira Bell is a detransitioned woman. So when she was a teenager, she went through the Tavistock and Portman NHS clinic in the UK. She was prescribed puberty blockers and then went on to cross sex hormones and eventually had actual trans surgeries. Eventually, she came to the conclusion that transitioning really wasn't for her, and so started the process of detransitioning. Now, she is going to live with the impact of that transition for the rest of her life, and she felt that the trans clinic didn't really do their job in making her aware of where it was she was signing up to. So she joined forces with an unnamed mother of a trans child and took Tavistock and Portman to court where the judge actually found in the claimant's favour. And initially, I was almost surprised at this. I mean, a lot of our institutions are being co-opted by the woke orthodoxy, but in this instance, sanity actually won. And there are some very good reasons for that. First and foremost, the case wasn't discussing whether or not cross-sex hormones or transitioning a young person is a real beneficial medical treatment. It did not comment on that at all. What it discussed was a concept known as Gillick competence, which sounds a little bit strange, but in a nutshell, Gillick competence is just to make sure that a person under the age of 16 is aware of what the implications of a medical treatment could be, and they need to be considered Gillick competent in order to receive said treatment. Now, in this instance, when it comes to transitioning and puberty blockers, the court found that there was an incredibly high chance of the puberty blockers going on to cross-sex hormones. In fact, studies afterwards have shown that this prevalence is incredibly high. And so therefore, just simply knowing the impact of puberty blockers on a child is not enough to attain that competence. You also need to have the understanding of what the rest of your transition will entail. And I think that's completely reasonable because when you start a transition, really, you need to be 100% sure. You need to know everything which is going to be happening and you need to be 100% okay with it because it is a huge life-changing commitment. Can somebody under the age of 16 really be reasonably aware of issues pertaining to fertility when they're older, or their sex life, or how they might be treated, or the actual health implications of even going on something like puberty blockers. There are so many different concepts to really take into account. It's very difficult for even an adult, I would argue, to be 100% aware of exactly what it is that they are signing up for. And when it comes to a 16-year-old, again, I don't think that they are necessarily going to fully acknowledge everything which they're going to go through. It's important just to acknowledge that this only discussed whether or not they are aware of the implications of it. It did not talk about whether or not the treatment is effective. That's important because the way that the narrative has been spun is that this is an attack on trans rights, when it really isn't. All they're commenting on is whether or not somebody is aware of what is going to happen. Now, activists might point to the amount of people who are going on puberty blockers and then basically going on to cross-sex hormones as 
proof that this treatment is 100% worth it and all the clinicians are right all the time. However, there are many problems with this. First and foremost, in the court case, it came out that the Tavistock Clinic actually considered basically everyone who went on puberty blockers to be 100% aware of what it was they were signing up to. In fact, they didn't think that this question ever really arose. That's a little bit concerning. That's saying that of the hundreds of people who have gone through the clinic over the last 10 years, everyone apparently knew what they were doing. They didn't have any real notable instances of them thinking, hold on, this person might not necessarily know what they're signing up for when it's such big, life-changing treatment. I don't get how that's statistically possible. And the fact they don't even keep a record of it in case it's such a thing is hugely incompetent on their part. And that would at least help strengthen the argument that maybe they know everything they're doing and they are rigorous in doing so. I mean, I've talked about Barbie Kardashian in the past, who was someone who was actually turned down by Tavistock. But that almost feels like it was a complete, you know, like a blip in the ocean when they talk about everyone else who's gone through it and seemingly how easy it is to get treatment. In fact, even with the fairly lax um, definitions of what it is to be trans for a child, so many people can fit into it, and are they really being rigorously tested? I don't think they are, and let me just explain a bit more why. I'm sure a lot of you might have heard about conversion therapy for trans people. Now, what do you think when you hear the word conversion therapy, you might be thinking of torture, of electroconvulsive therapy, or those horrendous camps that you see being set up in places like America or South America, where gays and lesbians and bi people and trans people are effectively tortured, some to death, simply over their sexuality, or in some cases their gender identity. That's not exactly what activists are referring to when they talk about conversion therapy. Of course, that is part of it, and I think that everyone can agree that torture needs to be banned. However, there is another side to that debate that really kind of calls into question what's kind of known as affirmation treatment. Now, some of you might be aware of a clinic in the UK called Gender GP, who were kind of struck off a couple of months ago, but they are a very well-respected name within the trans community. So this isn't a post by a random medium blogger, this is an actual organisation that a lot of people have given money to and basically swear by. They did an article on the kind of implications of conversion therapy and they noted a couple of interesting phrases that, well, are a bit worrying. So, according to Gender GP, they mentioned some of the kind of tortures that people go through in this process, but then they also state it's important to recognise not all conversion therapy is extreme and gave a list of phrases you might hear, including, you will grow out of it, it's just a phase. If you have a vagina, you are a girl. Boys don't wear dresses. You will bring shame on the family if you think like that. You shouldn't try and change how you were made. Are you sure you will feel like this? Do you think you'll pass as a woman? How is this different to simply being a lesbian? You shouldn't use puberty blockers to block your natural puberty. You shouldn't change, take hormones to change your external appearance. Your child will most likely grow out of this, and so on and so forth. A lot of these questions are ones I would expect a clinician to be asking. For example, just the idea that someone is going to go through a huge life-changing decision and you shouldn't even be asking them whether they are sure. That's effectively what this is saying. Any kind of questioning is tantamount to conversion therapy, and that's where this whole affirmation model comes in. The idea that you shouldn't really be questioning someone's gender, whether they say that they are trigender, moon gender, man, woman, whatever. If someone says it, then that's it. And we know that this is a common trans idea. When you have people like this who say they are women and you must accept them as a woman simply because they say so, you can't ask any questions about it. That all comes from the affirmation model because all you're doing is you're simply just agreeing with what the person who has told, who's told you this which is obscene. And yes, I know I used an extreme example there, but I think I'm perfectly in the right to do so when that is the kind of end point 
of this weird idea that they have. If you can't question anyone about their gender, why do you think that they will have absolutely any kind of scrutiny when it comes to a child transitioning? If a child says that they are a boy or a girl, then you have to listen to them. That's what affirmation means. And a lot of this also ignores the general desistance that a lot of trans-labeled children pre-puberty actually go through. In fact, a lot of the studies that Dr. Deborah So has looked into have seen up to between 60 and 90 percent of all labelled trans children actually desisting by the time they hit puberty. Now, this does kind of change when you start putting them on blockers and start actually putting them down that pathway. But then there's still questions about are they really being reassured whilst they're going through this? I mean, as Tavistock has said, Basically, every, almost everyone who goes on puberty blockers is then also given hormones. And that seems to be completely unquestioned. Again, when you're dealing with the affirmation model, is that really the right thing? Do you really think that any of these kids are going to be, you know, having any kind of discussion about, are you sure this is the right thing that you want to do? I mean, I don't, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that that's the point. I and mean, hell, look at the reaction to this BBC article discussing Tavistock's own study. It was thoroughly deriled by trans activists who saw it as blatant transphobia. Simply to voice this was transphobia. So put yourself in the, the shoes of these clinicians. They could potentially risk their jobs, as many of us do, simply by speaking out against this orthodoxy. And then you have some of the really bizarre takes that came from the trans community as a result of all this. You had mermaids pointing out that you have to do this, otherwise plenty of trans kids are going to kill themselves, which, you know... It's really like an abuser. That's an abuser's narrative there. Or one of the more bizarre ones coming from Zinnia Jones. Just about two weeks ago, Zinnia actually made a fairly bizarre tweet on putting everyone on blockers, saying an inability to offer informed consent or understand the long-term consequences is actually an argument for putting every single cis and trans person on puberty blockers until they acquire that ability. So really, that's, first of all, blatant biology denial. You can't argue that. You're saying that someone's own natural function, everyone's natural function needs to be stopped simply because a very, very small minority might not identify in that way. That's insane. That's absolutely insane. But also is ignoring the potential health risks that involve puberty blockers because there's simply not enough of a study to really determine what the long-term effects on this are. And again, this was brought up in the court case. But when you're dealing with all of these kind of bizarre takes, all of this, like, calling for people's heads, are you really surprised that clinicians aren't going to be challenging their patients, especially kids, when it comes to this? Like, probably a lot of them are terrified. I mean, hell, look, the kind of kids that they had for Tavistock in the, in the judgment, some of them clearly had no idea of what the implications of this would be going forward. There was a 13-year-old saying that, well, he, he doesn't think about having kids. And of course he doesn't, because he's 13. And he doesn't, and they don't think about their sex lives, because they're still children. They shouldn't be thinking about their sex lives. And they're being told to make decisions, based, <laughs> which could impact that for good at such a young age. But the real argument about this really comes down to, are kids honestly aware of what it is they're going through? And I always maintain this position that 16 is the reasonable age to do so. There is no scientific consensus that says a person under the age of 16 is competent enough in the eyes of the law to understand what it is that they're going through. Anyone who says that is lying, first and foremost. There are no studies saying that a person under the age of, everyone under the age of 16 knows it. Of course, there might be some, but these are all individual cases. But also, when it comes to the actual effectiveness, when it comes to the actual effectiveness of the treatment, I'm not arguing that transition is bad for anyone with gender dysphoria at all. That's not at all what my argument is. Because if I could look at myself, you know, years ago, I would know that transitioning earlier would have been the best step for me. And, you know, I also know people like Miss London or Ella Grant who transitioned when they were young. And it's clearly been a big success for them. When we just have this affirmation model where everyone who says that they are a gender has to be accepted, then I get very, very sceptical. And I'm not convinced that actual pro proper professionals are able to do their job competently.
I don't think that that's happening because of the amount of pressure that's being put on them. And in fact, in Deborah So's book, she talks about just that. There's so much activist pressure on these people and hell, even former Tavistock staff themselves have said so. There are real issues here. And the fact that trans activists want to simply paint this as yet another version of oppression that everyone is going through when they can't even be honest enough to simply say, Actually, you know what, maybe we might need to be sceptical about 14-year-old um, Jimmy who might also be Tammy and also Bob at the same time because they've decided they are trigender. Like, they're not, if they're not going to be sceptical about any kind of transition, they shouldn't then expect everyone to be on board when you're giving kids hormone blockers. What should we do to meet up then? Well, scrap the affirmation model. Actually put in some scepticism. Don't accuse everyone who's disagreeing with you of being a bigot or wanting to convert people into not being trans. Actually let people explore it. And when we say explore it, we don't just mean say, yes, of course, Timmy, you're actually Tammy. What we mean is maybe they are, maybe they're not. Maybe we should be giving them actual mental health care. Because again, when it comes to the arguments about suicides, None of us are ever saying that these kids should not have treatments. What we're saying is maybe putting them on puberty blockers when we really don't know enough about the future is not the right step. But this is a passionate subject for a lot of people. I've seen a lot of passionate arguments about it. I have always maintained that I think that 16 is the reasonable age to start a transition. And if anything, this judgment really kind of, well, it kind of goes into what my beliefs already were, being completely honest but Tavistock should have actually been more prepared. And what's more, I think that the people who push for this need to have more of an understanding as well that maybe just because somebody says their agenda doesn't make that so. Just because people are being put on puberty blockers now doesn't mean that they're going to stay transitioned for the rest of their life. Because again, there's simply not enough data on that. Right now, it's a real experimental treatment. Let's treat it as such and not pretend it's just fact. But what do you think of this? Please let me know in the comments. Thank you all once again for watching. I know it's been a long time since my last video and I really want to give a special thank you to everyone who supported me during this time. Uh, if you like what I do, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. You can also support me on Patreon and Subscribestar. Thank you all once again. I'll see you all next time. And a special thanks to Alex Meadows, Aurora T. Silver, Carla Jackson, Casey Adolphson, Gray Brother, Ida Meadows, James C. George, James UK, Jess, Kim Vandry, Lucy, Laura Man, Lee, Rose Hypnol, Steve Hendricks, Zoe, Leisha, Laterati, and Apora Rizzo, and the rest of my supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar.